history and is the author of Real and Imagined Widows, Gender Relations in Colonial North India, as well as an edited volume on gender and violence in historical and contemporary perspectives situating India, a recent book. Thank you very much, Professor Rupees. Um, it is indeed an honor and a pleasure to be invited by uh, Professor Rita again for a lively conference, which I'm sure will be lively. We have two days of uh, great papers lined up. And uh, thank you so much, Rita, for always having me in your conference, and I've always enjoyed it. Thank you so much for asking me, giving me the opportunity to present some of my thoughts. Now, at the outset, I, at the outset, I must confess that I'm not a medieval history historian. I am a uh, modern historian and I work on gender. So there are some things which attracted me to this period, to the writings of Manucci. And so uh, there are some uh, things which I'd like to share with you and of course I'd like some comments on that. The settling down of the Portuguese in India was a remarkable political cultural process. The initial stages that span most of the 16th century were marked by intense observations of the indigenous societies and cultures. Religious and class reordering were the main features of Portuguese settlement and uh, Professor Rubiz has already spoken about hybridity and other important aspects. Most of the contemporary sources are unanimous that 16th century saw the rise of Portuguese power in India. An anonymous journal of the first voyage of Vasco da Gama named Retiro claimed that all whom the little kingdom could spare, both soldiers and traders, were dis dispatched to consolidate its hold upon the Eastern Empire, which, as far as the theory went, was one of the greatest that has ever existed. Pope Alexander VI described King of Portugal as, quote-unquote, Lord of Navigation, Conquest, and Trade of Ethiopia, Arabia, Persia, and India. So the geography is magnificent. It is significant to note at the outset that there emerges a methodological problem while reading the contemporary narratives on Portuguese presence in India. Most of the sources are sensationalist as they magnify the dimensions of violence in the Portuguese territories, which you had also spoken about. Alternatively, some sources highlight the spiritual aims with which the Portuguese set forth on their career, set on upon their career of empire in India. Uh, significant scholarship exists on the Portuguese empire, particularly in the 17th century. M. N. Pearson argued that Portugal was a poor country with a bulk of the population suffering from disease and mortality. Goa, where they settled down, must have looked like paradise to a 16th century Portuguese peasant. Secondly, the uh, Lusitanian imperial effort was characterized throughout more by reciprocity and interaction than by unilateral imposition of Portuguese political culture. In exploring this negotiability of cultures and religion, Pius Malikandatil, uh, my colleague at Center for Historical Studies, JNU, has looked at the politics of religious dialogue between Akbar and Jesuit missions in the late 19th, in the late 16th century. Akbar ordered translation of the gospel where the line, E Naam, E to Jesus, O Krishtu, was derived from the Islamic Bismillah ur Rahman ur Rahim. Notwithstanding these syncretic cultural moments, most of the 17th century was marred by rising social tensions within the expanding empire. The Konkani Saraswat Brahmins and Banya merchants had moved into Goa, which was the center of the Portuguese political power. This began to threaten the ethnic composition of Goa and resulted in immigration of Portuguese residents. The Portuguese officials developed a propagandist approach by highlighting the city's imageries and metaphors of shrine of Saint Xavier, of Saint Francis Xavier, and so on. Uh, the presence of the Portuguese in India was also, uh, also the idea of containing sexuality within domesticity was very dominant. And it was supported by the Catholic Portuguese priests and the Hindu priests. The issue of the Devdasis put the Catholic Portuguese in discomfort with the Hindus. 
this particular paper primarily focuses on Manucci's description of the gender relations in the Portuguese society in a 16th, 17th century colonial space. The politics over writing on women's bodies and sexual behavior needs to be understood through the lens of modern day feminist theories. For this reason, I extend Kate Millett's argument to this inquiry on gender relations in medieval India. Kate, Kate makes the attempt to define, describe, and provide examples of ancient uni and universal scheme for domination of one birth group by the other, the scheme that prevails in the area of sex. Um, so uh, it has already been mentioned that Goa, the capital of Portuguese India, composed of a multi-ethnic community. State management of marriage and family of the Portuguese men in India had a tremendous impact on gender relations. The Portuguese community consisted of soldados, casados, casticos, mesticos, reinos, male and female servants, and slaves. It is well known that Albuquerque instituted the policy of mixed marriages between Portuguese men and Indian women. The Portuguese officers appointed, the long -terms, appointed for long-term service in India were allowed to bring their wives and children. In this context, uh, I draw your attention to the scholarship of Elaine Sonsu, who has pointed out to the fact that it was mainly the poor and the exiled Portuguese men who first began marrying Indian women. Uh, another one of my colleagues, important uh, ex uh, expert on Portuguese in India, Joy Pachua, has drawn attention to a document dated 1514 from Cochin, where mention is made of women who associated with, with Portuguese men. These, there, there were about 58 women from different ethnic backgrounds. Uh, Malabari, Javanese, Moor, Canaries, Nair, Brahmin, Sakok, Trap, and Gujarati. She describes how church was under pressure to create the category of an ideal Christian. The important binary, however, of the Christian and the quote-unquote pagan was kept alive. Now move to some of the cases. The policy of bringing orphan Portuguese women to India also gained momentum around the 16th century. Convents and shelters mushroomed to house these women. <coughs> The convent of Santa Monica and Rohel uh, Recall Himento, the Santa Maria Magdalena in Goa, were important institutions. These institutions provided these women with some time to decide whether they wanted to join nunhood or they wished to get married. As wives and unmarried daughters, the Porto women in the Portuguese household found themselves, quote unquote, protected from men. The constitution of sexuality, morality, and divinity came together in the form of devdasis, or maid servants of the gods. Um, a very important scholar of Portuguese uh, women's history, Rosa Maria Perez, has pointed out that gender representations has shown how the role played by the dancer, uh, devdasi, in Portuguese, baladero, probably not pronouncing it rightly, provided a powerful tool for Portuguese colonial discourse, which was ambivalent in itself. She argues how, within the imagery of the Oriental, mainly Muslim cultures, the harem, the wheel, the polygamy, were highly charged symbols. Through the centuries, the European sexual desire was stimulated by fantasies about women's bodies. It is the body of the sexuated black female that brought together the narratives of exotic oriental eroticism and imagery of Mediterranean courtesans. Portuguese sources make a distinction between other women associated with Hindu temples and Devdasis. Uh, members of the Portuguese clergy as early as 1577 began condemning the dancers as immoral women. In 1699, the viceroy Antonio Luis Gonzalez de Camara issued an order announcing expulsion of the dancers from the Goan territory. A heavy fine was announced for those who hosted these women. Such a morally cleansing mission was crucial as many white women also kept some dancing girls. Uh, I'll, I will uh, go back to the point about Sati and then I will talk about what, uh, some of the cases from Manucci's account. Uh, Storia do Mugor. Um, I have argued in my, 
work earlier that the European travelers and visitors had sensationalized the Hindu rite of Sati through stories. These accounts or stories focus mostly on the Hindu widow's intense commitment towards her husband, even though the stories of widows having lost their modesty were rare. It is historically well established the rulers, both Islamic and Hindu, governed Sati long before the arrival of the British, and there's ample evidence to show that even British governed Sati uh, for 20 years before they actually called it a crime. Um, it is interesting to note how Manuchi feels that the Hindu widows gives consent to become the Sati. I, I quote Manuchi, when these ceremonies are finished, they, which is the relatives, turn the body over on its side. As they do so, the widows, without tears, nay, on the contrary, radiant and joyous, mounts to the top of the pyre and, lying down on her side, closely embraces her dead husband. At once, the relations bind her feet strongly by two ropes, two posts given into the ground for the purpose. Next, they throw some more wood and dried cow dung onto the two bodies. The quantity is almost as much as beneath them. The woman is then spoken to by her name, and three times distinctly she is called on to say whether she consents to go to heaven. To this she replies in the affirmative. Her answers having been received, they apply a light. And when the bodies have both been consumed, each man returns home, envying the firmness and constancy with which the woman had granted herself to be lit with fire. Now, Manochi also displays his, dis, displays his sense of pride in this murderous act, in, in uh, holding up this mur murderous act. He, men he mentions that envious men who wish that their wives should, he also mentions some of the envious men who wish that their wives commit sati when they die. So there's a sensational value attached to that. Um, the second, uh, and he talks about the four types of women uh, uh, classified by the Hindu tradition, uh, by Padmani, Chitrini, Ashtini, and Sankhini. The first type is perfect in mind and body and are faithful to their husbands. They're also witty. The second type does not possess the perfection of the first type, but they make good wives. The third and the fourth type are the, so he is classifying, the third and the fourth type um, do not maintain their fidelity and so on. It is in the context of moral purity that the Portuguese wives stood up in comparison with Hindu wives. Manuchi describes the Christian women in India as very eager to read futurity and know hidden things. Uh, I will not read all the cases because I think I'm going to run out of time. Uh, so just a few interesting cases of, of uh, Portuguese women committing crime, uh, murders, and so on. One of the examples, some of the examples, the top examples that appear in Manuchi's account is that of black magic. He talks about a Christian woman named Anna Was in Lahore who had mastered the art of talking to the dead. She had told Manuchi about an instance when the relatives of a dead Portuguese man wanted to know how he was, whether he was in paradise or purgatory. Anna fasted for seven days, and on the eighth day, at midnight, she bathed and went naked into the prayer room. She lit six candles and then began praying. Some pebbles fell on the, from the roof, and a man appeared clothed in black. She asked him about the dead man. He answered that he was in hell and there was no use praying for him anymore. Next morning, Anna told the relatives what the other person had told him, told her. After Manuchi heard the story and gave Anna, he gave Anna a good scolding. He said this was a sin and it was prohibit, prohibited by the church to indulge in such practices. And Anna told Manuchi, that she was performing welfare, but she said, okay, I will not do this again. So they were this reformatory task that he talks about. He was reforming women. In some other cases, Portuguese women in the household resorted to black magic by calling in the female local magicians. In San Thom, a poor Portuguese widow lived with two unmarried daughters, a rich young Portuguese man named Co Jao Cohel. Jao Coelho, Coelho, 
Coelho, fancied the elder daughter of the widow, but instead of sending a request for marriage, he sent an offer to her asking for asking her to become her mistress. This message caused insult to the family. The and a Rajava caste servant girl in the house offered to help with black magic. The widow agreed and servant brought in three Raj other Rajava girls. They rubbed a medicine onto the eyes of the elder daughter. When Coelho saw her, uh, when, Co when Coelho saw the elder daughter to whom he had earlier proposed to be mistress, he fell madly in love with her and rushed to the widow's house to ask for her hand in marriage. On having got married to Coelho, the elder daughter became lord over, con yet she totally controlled him and his wealth. After some time, the elder daughter became tired of too much of control and there was another, another magic performed so that the husband would not be too interested in her. So there was this balancing act through magic which could be, uh, which could be operational. Manachi writes, writes about slave girls in India with much abhorrence uh, and he discusses the crime within the Portuguese households. Um, another ex interesting example is a case from the Portuguese household in Madras. A slave girl planned to kill her mistress with the help of a sorcerer. The slave girl stole some money from the house. She gathered some hair, nail clippings and piece of uh, old piece of old cloth of the lady. The sorcerer made a doll which had pins thrust to it. One pin was thrust into the dead and to the head and to other to the navel. So uh, very briefly I'll summarize this. This particular woman fell sick after that and uh, then some someone else actually came to the house. A Hindu magician came to the house, probably white magic, pro practicing white magic. And he said, well, I would... I would take you off this and he discovered the doll, took out the doll and actually took out the pins and then in, within three months she recovered. So lots of these stories, one or two more examples and then I need to, I think I have, yeah, okay, 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 or, okay, right, thank you. Um, from the feminist perspective, early medieval women exercise public roles, rights, and responsibilities. Women contributed through their labor to the welfare of the community. Women played an important part in public affairs. They practiced birth control, abortion, and infanticide. Women committed crimes, and also they were indicted. They owned property and administered states. The drive towards economic growth and expansion abroad rested on the capacity of women to staff and manage economic endeavors at home. So while the Portuguese men were out, it is the Portuguese women at home who were basically looking after the welfare of the house. In the later Middle Ages in Europe, the social position of women altered significantly. Um, Manuchi describes a terrible affair that took place in the Portuguese territory. A, Portug a Portuguese couple had a dispute over the maid. The dispute, the husband had an affair with the servant, the Indian servant. The wife grew extremely revengeful towards the maid. One day, when the husband had gone out of town, the wife killed the servant, mutilated the body and ordered it to be buried in the garden of the house. The flesh removed from the body was taken to the kitchen and cooked as a dish for dinner. On her husband's return, she was he was served with the dish. The husband ate and praised it for its exquisite taste. The wife threw the dish at his face in anger and told him, quote, it was not enough to have enjoyed her while she was still alive. Even in death, she was of good savor. She abused her husband and left the house. So perhaps, uh, you know, assertion by these women or, you know, extreme jealousy, um, it's kind of negativity that is built into the account of the, of, of Manuchi. Um, and there are several other cases. Um, uh, the Portuguese, one Portuguese lady, Donna Escolastia, imprisoned her Mohammedan slave in the house for having stolen something. He was severely punished and deprived of food. As a result, he's died. So Manuchi writes, uh, I quote Manuchi, this murder of slaves and slave girls is common among the Portuguese and few are the houses in which skeletons of their bodies would not be found. Um, okay. Manuchi speaks of marriages 
where where due to impotency the bride sought separation from the husband and subsequently the freedom to remarry in one of the cases from goa there were seven men who were known well because of their impotency in the case of one of these who got married the wife left the house and announced him it's his impotency all over the city so manuji was also a physician uh, and he worked for the mughal court he he, he worked <coughs> several uh, several capacities um he also served the mughal empire uh he actually ma- gave some medicine to this man and then he was able to regain his uh, uh potency so it is kind of uh, you know a uh, self uh, significance that come that is uh, attached to this after 40 days this man regained his potency and he was able to save his marriage amongst the hindus there was an ancient fascination with the male potency and it's interesting to compare that uh, that uh, unmarried women worshiped shivalinga the belief was that this would help the girl find a good husband and enhance cup enhance couples reproductive strength uh, uh i just end with one paragraph now it is interesting to note that in 17th century germany the court transcripts were used by women they used the judicial system to negotiate boundaries of patriarchal power on the basis of protestant ethics during and after the reformation many protestant territories in germany established marriage courts in order both to manage and resolve an increasing number of divorce and separation cases therefore uh, finally to explore the underlying violence in portuguese women perhaps simple recourse to the colonial factors would not be sufficient some answers may be sought in the socio religious climate of europe women came across as lovers of violent methods in manuchi's account most cases by manuchi suggest that women uh, that in women, in portuguese men it is the urge to restore morality which leads to violence whereas in portuguese women it is the dark desire which provokes violence the gendered constitution of male and female violence in itself is a subject of further feminist research and uh, the last paragraph to conclude the portuguese gender relations in the colonial space which were man- tremendously also impacted by racial and moral concerns manuchi records women as being violent and incriminates them as sources of history it is crucial that such texts to be need to be revisited in the light of modern feminist scholarship thank you very much many thanks uh, for uh, this uh, fascinating look at the um, at all these cases of um, Manucci's stories, and also thanks for keeping to the time so well. Now we have time. For, uh, we should move on to the next paper. Yeah. So I'd like to introduce just a minute, Sonia um, Nair, who is assistant professor of the Department of English at All Saints College in Trivandrum, who has uh, worked on trans- transgender festivals of South India, and is. currently working on a biography of a transgender activist yes. from Kerala so please sonia good afternoon and my paper is on the hortus malabaricus and the cartographies of colonial knowledge now personally i find the hortus to be a rather interesting text because uh, as far as the malayali consciousness is concerned it it holds a special place because we are in equal parts both proud and ignorant of it and often you know the the hortus malabaricus is confined to or the knowledge about the hortus malabaricus is confined to a one mark question in the kerala public service commission exams and that's why mandatorily almost all malayali uh, people know about it because we all have these kerala psc aspirations and the question that generally comes generically comes is which is the first book in malayalam in which malayalam appeared in print for the first time and the answer is obviously the hortus and most citizens or or people or students i have spoken to have pretty much left it at that but you know upon quite intense investigations i have found that that's not where it should be stopping because the hortus carries 
depths of meanings in the annals of Kerala as well as world history. It's about how it is a witness to the knowledge that was possessed by a certain set of people who have been marginalized as less than human for a long period of time. And the Hortus, the story of the Hortus is one of discovery and rediscovery. So it's better to begin at the beginning or as far as I can go. Uh, so the Kerala or the then landmass uh, which wasn't called Kerala, had been divided into a number of kingdoms or principalities, and they had a history of viable exchanges with trading communities the world over. You know, the Bible has mentions of the Temple of Solomon that was built with timber brought from Kerala, and uh, St. Thomas has established a community of Syrian Christians long before the crusading flags of Europe had reached the shores of Kerala with uh, you know, the Jesuit missionaries. And in fact, the clashes between the St. Thomas Christians and the Jesuit missionaries had culminated in something uh, called the famous Synod of Diampa that happened in 1599, which led to far-reaching changes in the way that uh, the entire uh, liturgy of Syrian Christians was fashioned. And the links between the Greeks and the Romans and the Malabar is also well known. The dominance of the Muziri sport and the flourishing trade relations that had made Malabar famous in that part of the world. And in fact, it was the discovery of the monsoon winds uh, in terms of you know, how, harnessing the same for a quick passage that led to better thought out patterns of trade. And of course, there's the angle of pepper, which was the preferred spice for trade, and the arboreal wealth uh, that the land yielded in terms of timber. And in fact, we also had a significant Jewish presence, nearly 3,000 year old Jewish history in Kerala. And you know, you have songs by people like the Rabino Nisi, who sang about having traveled all the way to Shingli in uh, Kerala to see the Jewish king, which meant that you know, they, they did have a system of governance all of their own to which uh, they had, well, they were doing quite well with it. And the main kingdoms were Travancore, Cochin, the Koladri kingdom, as well as the Calicut, which was ruled by the Zamorin, and you had a number of minor principalities which dabbled in the majority politics of the time. And apart from the Syrian Christians and the Jews, the Arabs were the ones who enjoyed trade and settlement rights from the rulers of Malabar, and they won favors particularly from the Samudri who, as uh, Dr. Rubis was mentioning in the morning, you know, it was the job to keep the traders happy. So there were a number of Islamic settlements in and around Calicut, and I think the the first mosque in, in India was at Kudungalur. Now, there are detailed accounts of uh, Arab activities in the Malabar and their maritime relations with the various coasts of Malabar. And as I told you, the presence of Islam was a respected ideology in Malabar. And there are also these legends that the last ruler of Malabar, that is the last Chera ruler of Malabar, had decided to embrace Islam and he was going away to Mecca, so he divided his kingdom among the three principalities, the Koladris, uh, the king of Cochin, and the ruler of Travancore. And then the Zamorin turned up and asked for his share, and he said, all I have to give you is my sword, so you live by this, conquer, <coughs> plunder, and make a kingdom for yourself. But there's no way of substantiating this because the Jews, uh, I think the Buddhists, the Jains, they've all claimed that the last ruler of Kerala had adopted their religion. So there are substantial narratives of travel with regard to the Malabar, and most deal with the natural wealth of the land. Like when Marco Polo visited uh, Kerala, he was talking about the, uh, the pepper and how pepper is prepared in order to be processed and so on. So these and many such accounts contributed immensely to the urgency with which the colonial missions spread in Malabar. And initially what started off as trade grew to aspirations to um, acquire monopoly of the trade and the changing regimes in Malabar were reflections of the changing equations of power in Europe. So one of the most significant players in the making of Malabar and ultimately Kerala history are the Portuguese. Cochin passed into the hands of the Portuguese in the 16th century, and it had become a very important port. Cochin had become a very important port after uh, there was a flood in the rivers around Muziri's port, and the port had silted. That was in 1341, making the Muziris no longer viable. And therefore, the choice automatically shifted to Cochin, and then the connotations and the permutations of trade and how desirable Cochin was in, in terms of economics also changed. So the Samudri had his eyes on Cochin, and uh, he was aided in his initiatives by the Allies. 
And so the arrival of the Portuguese was seen as a blessing by the Cochin king who felt that now he has somebody in his corner who would be able to counter the advances of the Samudri. But this did not make it any better for the king of Cochin because he was reduced to the status of being a mere vassal. And uh, this time this was just by the Portuguese. So the close of the 16th century saw the rise of the Dutch in Europe. And this was reflected in the simultaneous incursions into Malabar. And they found ready collaborators in the Zamorin. And this resulted in the Treaty of 604, which referred to the Samudri as the Emperor of Malabar. So the subsequent wars between Cochin and Calicut were a amply aided by the Portuguese and the Dutch, respectively, as a means of helping the winner gain access to the teak forests that were under Cochin's control. And in other parts of the world, uh, the, the Dutch had gained control of places such as Malacca, Ceylon, um, from the Portuguese. And so you see that, you know, there, is, there has been this, uh, this kind of a, an overtaking that was happening. And in 1663, the Dutch finally managed to out the Portuguese and gain control of the Cochin Fort. And the old queen mother uh, at the Cochin Fort was taken prisoner by Hendrik van Reed, an important figure in the times to come. So the Dutch installed a ruler of their choice on the throne, and the then general, Van Gens, who is again an important figure in, in uh, the future, becomes, uh, you know, kind of crowns the king, and the, the crown is made of gold, and it bears the symbol of the Dutch East India Company. And the Dutch were given complete authority over the Cochin Fort, and were allowed to trade so long as the sun and the moon exist. So the monopoly of trade in pepper and cinnamon was given to the Dutch. And another significant development was that no Portuguese priests were allowed to stay in the fort at Cochin. The priests and the other Christians were made to go, and they could take anything with them, any of their possessions with them, so long as it was not made of gold or silver. So what we see here is that the Dutch became the de facto rulers of Cochin and therefore enjoyed perfect freedom over trade and commerce. And not only were they in a position to flourish, they were also in a position to limit the opportunities available for the other colonial aspirants, such as the Portuguese and the British. Now, by the time the fall of uh, Tipu Sultan had come about, the Dutch influence in Malabar had also waned and a new day had dawned. But it's in the middle years, in these middle years, that, uh, you know, we are concentrating upon. That is, uh, as mentioned before, the Dutch got what they came for, the monopoly on trade. And the VOC, or the Dutch East India Company, was doing extremely well. The shareholders were receiving 40% returns on their investments. So given the circumstances, what could be the motivation for launching an exercise such as documenting the plant wealth of the Malabar? Well, the reasons were twofold. One was that in 1673, Hendrik Adrian van Reed took charge as the commander of Cochin, and he was a soldier by profession, not a very educated soldier either. But, and he did not definitely have any interest in botany or any knowledge in botany. That was by his own admission. But he was witness to the number of battles and the skirmishes that the Dutch uh, were involved in, in and around Cochin, and he realized that the Dutch, native, the Dutch soldiers were constantly injured and were taking longer periods to recover as compared to the native soldiers who fought alongside them. And he says that, you know, the native soldiers had access to the native medicines and their native doctors, whereas the Dutch soldiers had to wait for the medicines to come in from Amsterdam. And the journey would take as long as about six months, by which time the medicines would have lost their efficacy. If not completely, then at least partially. And these medicines had been, first of all, procured from the Malabar by the Arabs, taken to Europe, sold at a rather handsome price to the Dutch, and then they would make their way back. So what Van Reed felt was that if you cut out the middleman, then not only, you know, do you have better access to medical facilities, but also, you know, there's the fact that you could make a handsome profit. It's a lot of money to be saved. And the other reason was rather political in nature, because both Cochin and Ceylon were in the race to be the, you know, one of the command centers of the Dutch East India Company. And Ceylon was being managed or, or let's say, administered by Van Gens, who was also Van Reed's mentor. And uh, Van Gens desperately wanted Ceylon to be declared the command center, but then Van Reed felt that 
Cochin or the Malabar was better suited on account of the immense wealth possibilities that it presented, not just in the trade of pepper or cinnamon for that matter, but also in terms of the plant wealth. So this book, the Hortus Malabaricus, was a way for Van Reed to show how, you know, how much wealthier Cochin or Malabar was in terms of uh, plant wealth and diversity as opposed to Ceylon. So this kind of led to a rather acrimonious uh, split between the two commanders. And in fact, after uh, the Mahotis had released, the first volume had come out, uh, Van Gens wrote a rather scathing letter to the uh, to the people in Amsterdam, saying that this was nothing special. We have these and much more. And in order to prove his point, he had also appointed uh, a botanist, you know, from his side also, somebody called Paul Herman, a very respected botanist, uh, you know, in order to show that there was significant plant wealth in Ceylon. So the, uh, the story of the Hortus Malabaricus is of immense value, not only in understanding the circuits of power and knowledge configurations of the 17th century, but also in terms of understanding the ways the work engaged with native society of the time. The Hortus is one of the great works of botanical significance of the 16th and 17th centuries that dealt with plants of the Indian subcontinent. We have Ota's Colloquies, we have Cristobal Acosta's Treatise of the Drugs and Medicines of the East Indies, and Lemperer's Jardin de Lorigza of the 19, uh, 1690s, and of course Paul Herman's work in Ceylon. And uh, in fact, Paul Herman's work after about 70 years was included in Carl Linnaeus's systems of classification based on the sexual uh, classifications of the plants. And uh, so coming back to the Hortus, the history of uh, the Diocese of Verapoli, which is one of the oldest and most respected dioceses in Kerala, mentions the contributions of Father Matthews of St. Joseph, one of their own priests who played a foundational role in the making of the Hortus. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the Catholics had all been driven out of Cochin. So they had settled in the outskirts. And Father Matthews felt that, you know, uh, if Hendrik van Reed was so interested in botany, a uh, collection of plants, uh, you know, of in and around the area would probably entice him so much so that he could give permission to build a church on the outskirts of Cochin. And that's exactly what happened. So, you know, you have uh, Father Matthews' work. It's called the Viridarium. And these were the pictures that he had, uh, you know, drawn. And these, of course, uh, Van Reed appreciated and charged Father Matthews with the task of preparing the Hortus Malabaricus as he had envisaged it. But what happened was that uh, Paul Herman visited Van Reed at that point of time and told him that these rather haphazard classifications and rather sketchy ways of doing it will not give justice to the vision that Van Reed had, you know, kind of wrought out with regard to the uh, Malabaricus. So this was the reason that Van Reed changed his illustrators and in the process of compiling the book now, he was assisted by dozens of experts including physicians, scientists, artists, plant collectors, interpreters, etc. from Malabar and Europe. So the book was first written in Malayalam because the people who were collecting these samples knew only Malayalam and they had a working knowledge of Portuguese because the Portuguese had occupied the Malabar for a period much longer than the Dutch had. So the book was first written in Malayalam, then it was translated to Portuguese, and then to Dutch, and finally to Latin, because uh, Van Reed felt that it would not have the credibility if it weren't written in Latin. So this was the long-winded route that the Hortus followed before it was finally released. So, uh, you know, there are people like John Caesarius who was translating the book from Dutch to Latin. Then the final illustrations were made by people like Anthony Jacob and Marcel Splinter. And you had four Malayalis, or let's say Malabaris, who were working on the, on the plants, namely Itti Achudan, Rangabhat, Appu Bhat, and Vinayat Pandit. Now, the contributions of these people uh, will form the focus in the later part of this paper. And you had uh, Emmanuel Carnero and uh, Donep, who were the translators. And the manuscripts and uh, tra illustrations were prepared at Cochin, both at the Dutch Palace, as well as at a place called David Hall. And uh, the history of David Hall is also quite interesting, because in the later times, it was a warehouse. Okay? And then, you know... Uh, for a long time, it lay abandoned. I mean, after all this, 
you know, the Hortus was written and sent off and everything. It lay abandoned for a long time. And then with the coming of the Cochin Binale is when the space had been reclaimed and people were actually made aware of his history. So there are these, you know, segments of, of uh, let's say, places and landscapes that lie dormant uh, till something like this comes about. So, and of course, he had a number of editors like Arnold van Sien, then you had Munich, Alminoven, uh, Abraham van Poot. Now, about 780 species of the most important plants of Malabar were described in the Hortus Malabaricus and were supported with 794 really beautiful illustrations. This is the cover page. Now, along with the description of each plant in Latin, uh, there were also the names uh, of the plants written in Malayalam, the Nagari script, Roman, and Arabic, because, you know, Arabi Malayalam, okay? And the medicinal properties of the plants, the method of preparation, application of the medicine are also given in the book. And most of the information regarding the medicinal properties of the plants were given by the four Malabaris that I mentioned earlier. Now, um, mm, he talks about the process by which the the book had been prepared. That is, they would all sit together, including Van Reed, and people would have discussions. He says, I often attended a most beautiful, a delightful entertainment for this instance when these Brahmin and Gentile philosophers disagreed and disputed with each other by weight of arguments which they took from maxims, rules, verses from antiquity, and books of their ancestors who were renowned for their learning. Indeed, they disputed and strongly defended their own opinions, but with incredible modesty, as you might even miss in the most distinguished philosophers of the world. They honor antiquity and the first inventors of their sciences with the most pious reverence. And by them, they judge their own views and also their own experiences and subject them to their authority. Okay? And uh, he says that, you know, uh, they, they had these discussions where they would talk about the plants, their curative values, their properties, and so on. And they did this so skillfully that if anyone mentioned the proper name of some plant, any Brahmin will at once answer you, stating whatever has been and can be said about it. Although, however, this method of teaching, which requires a tenacious memory, seems to be rather difficult, they still impress these verses with playful ease on the memories of the young. So what we see is that, you know, there is this emphasis on oral education and something that uh, Van Reed also points out. And, but what is striking about the book, you know, compared to the other books of this time that were written, was that there were these certificates of authenticity that Van Reed uh, kind of insisted were put in. And uh, one second, yeah. This here is, ah, this here is the certificate of authenticity that was prepared by Itti Achudan. Okay, uh, and this is a form of Malayalam that is no longer in use. It was replaced. This is called Kol Erta. And uh, later on, Emmanuel Carnero translates the same thing into Arya Erta which is another form of Malayalam, a Sanskritized and more modern form of Malayalam from which the Malayalam of today has been derived. And, you know, Itti Achudan in this uh, document says that he had come here on the invitation of the uh, Commodore Van Reed, and he has examined these plants, seeds, as well as all the, uh, the trees, etc. And he has given knowledge about these things from their books, or he says from our books. I have given this knowledge from our books, and I have found this to be correct. Okay? And uh, this book that he's referring to is something called a Cholketu Pustagam, uh, something that was there in his family, or rumored to be there in his family for 400 years, and now is lost. So we really don't know. And the three Konkani physicians have also given their certificates. Uh, of course, this is written in the Nagari script, and you can see their signatures. And here they say that they have provided information from their books, and they refer to a book that is called Mahaningatanam, which is, which is, there's no book like that. And the thing is that uh, later on, people have kind of derived the idea that probably they were referring to the Mahanigandu, which could be a book that had information about these plants and other medicinal properties. So if Van Reed hadn't taken the trouble of recording and preserving the valuable ethnobotanical as well as ethno knowledge contained in the above books, they would have been lost to the present-day society. And uh, in that sense of the term, Hortus Malabaricus is the only authentic record of this available to us. And when it was published in the 17th century, the scientists in Europe acclaimed the Hortus as a milestone in the field of plant science. 
And in fact, uh, Itti Achudan belonged to the Irava community, and I will be coming to that quite soon. Uh, and he had given his own systems of classifications, and they had found correlations between plants that technically may or may not have existed as per you know, European classifications. For example, you have the example of the Onapur, something that even Richard Grove mentions. Onapur is a, poo, uh, is a flower that uh, blooms during that Onam time. Okay? And they have classified it into Valia Onapur, Onapur, and Cherya Onapur. Big, small, and well, the normal Onapur. And the, the thing is that, you know, uh, technically, they are not related to each other, but uh, in terms of the botanical classifications. But what has happened is that these Irava botanical classifications and the medicinal garden schemes, uh, you know, uh, were recreated intact in Leiden's botanical garden, the Hortus Botanicus. And after 75 years, uh, you know, during the renaissance of uh, botanical science, Carl Linnaeus, the father of modern botany, on several occasions made mention about the significance of this book and establishing that 250 new species had come from it. And, you know, you had a number of different people such as Haskell, Adinson, you know, Denstead, who used the Hortus malabaricus to name new taxa, treating the diagrams in the book as actual types, because the herbarium or the you know, preserved samples of Van Reed have been lost. So they have taken the diagrams in the book itself as you know, types, and they have classified further plants based on that. And uh, modern botany also has classifications such as Achudemia, that comes from Achudin, a genus of plants belonging to the nettle family. Redia is also a genus of plants. Now, anyway, coming back to the Hortus, uh, you know, Van Reed was soon transferred to Batavia, and he took the relevant information with regard to the Hortus with him. And uh, after the first two volumes were prepared, you know, he sent them off to Amsterdam, but he retained a copy here in case, at, at Batavia, in case they got lost at sea. And uh, the publishers of the first volume, curiously, died the following year after it was published, and thereby, you know, kind of gave the hortus a rather superstitious coloring, since we're talking about superstitions. And uh, it was, the second volume was brought out by the widows of the, uh, the people who had died, and by the time the third volume came, the money had run out, so they had to form a consortium of publishers to cut the losses between them, if at all any happened. Anyway, uh, and the thing was that the book was not an ordinary size. It was folio or double folio in some cases, and uh, the engravings were made on copper before they had been, you know, before they were ready for printing. So that was the model that he was following. Anyway, and uh, one person, that is Alma Lovine, tried to translate two of the volumes into English, but he soon gave up, possibly because of the poor reception of the books. Now, medically, the book suggests 136 plants for curing fever, 86 to relieve pain, uh, and uh, 66 for healing wounds, arthritis, there were 53 of them, eye ailments, 51 remedies, stomach aches, 48, and 20 for cholera. So we see that, you know, all the ailments that the Dutch could encounter in the Malabar were all addressed. Now, besides these, there were remedies for gonorrhea, ulcers, there were aphrodisiacs, and remedies also to reduce the sex drive of men. That's very interesting. And in all, there were about 2,789 remedies for 210 ailments. And most of the uh, ailments, as I told you, were covered, uh, people that they could encounter in the tropics. Now, there was this one particular plant called uh, Puvanpeda, which uh, till, I think, uh, 20 years ago used to grow on these compound walls. It, it's a kind of a moss. And uh, the special mention made of the Puan Pada because, you know, we don't see that these days because Malayalis have discovered pressure pumps, so they get rid of all of this. Uh, the Puan Pada, uh, is, as suggested by the, uh, the Vaidyans, if you take it and you mash it and you apply it, you know, it's a, it's a good cure for cataract. That is, uh, suppose there's cataract in your right eye, you're supposed to apply it to uh, the nail area of your big toe on the left leg. And if the cataract is in the left eye, you're supposed to do the converse. Uh, I suppose it's the, the crosswise. So uh, there were these very interesting remedies, such as these mentioned. And occasionally, you know, in the illustrations, you have native men uh, coming in as, you know, toddy tappers or in conversation with uh, a well-dressed uh, Dutch official. And people say it could have been Van Reed, but only his back is uh, visible. Am 
I done? Oh, yeah, sure. So uh, the paper, in the spirit of uh, fashioning identities, looks into the implications that these certificates have had in terms of providing a discourse on traditional indigenous medicine. Uh, I had already told that before. Mm. Yes, so now I would like to talk about uh, why it is that the figure of Itti Achudan is so important in, in the compilation of uh, the Hortis. It is because he was in Irava, and the Iravas were a rather marginalized community. They were subjected to the, uh, you know, the, the, the oppression of the caste system and were perennial slaves to the whims of the upper caste. Now, apart from being considered impure and not being allowed to enter temples and so on, there was a time in Kerala when something as basic as applying sacred ash to the forehead was denied to the Iravas. So there was only, you know, up to the Nair community, people could apply uh, the sacred ash on their forehead. Below that, that is the Iravas and below were not allowed to do so. And they had to petition and fight for the right to apply uh, sacred ash. So, f you know, for such a community to be involved in something so monumental as the Hortus, uh, puts into perspective, you know, it's an, it's an act of writing back and it cleanly divides knowledge into Brahminical and non-Brahminical and in the process it stands to reason that there is significant historical redressal and reclamation waiting to happen in terms of uh, appropriation of indigenous knowledge that Itti Achudan quite freely gave away. Because later on, you know, like when the 2003 edition of the, I mean, uh, the Hortus was translated into English only in 2003 and then into Malayalam in 2008, thanks to the pioneering efforts of a man called Professor K.S. Manilal. Now, that story is dramatic in its own sense of the term. We really can't go into it. But uh, anyway, when it was translated in 2003 and in 2008 subsequently, there were people of the Irava community who wrote to the University of Kerala, which had financial translations, saying that you should not be letting these books go out of the country first thing. And the second is that, you know, you cannot publish this without our permission because much of this is our knowledge. So this question of, you know, who should be claiming knowledge and what are the politics of claiming knowledge really comes into question. And also, you know, there's this idea that, you know, uh, Ayurveda was something of a, a territory of the Brahmins. And, you know, we had these images in the media and otherwise of, you know, Brahmins composing Ayurvedic texts uh, when the advertisements for soaps and all used to come, Ayurvedic soaps. So we would have this image of the Brahmin uh, sitting and writing uh, on the Thali Ola Granthams. And people have been inordinately proud of this. But, you know, when you come to realize that uh, that is not the case, that these, knowledge, that these systems of knowledge came from somewhere way below, uh, you know, people who had been denied and people who had been seen as ignorant or not possessing valuable or viable information, it kind of, you know, uh, upends the entire idea of even Kerala modernity because the idea of granting rights to the, uh, people to enter the temple or the idea of education. See, all of these things are, are then put into perspective. So I would say that the possibilities of discussion on the Hortus are immense and they're only beginning. Because in the newspaper clippings of the 1950s, uh, what would happen is that there were only cursory references to Itti Then We would have, you know, things like, oh, these are the, I'll come to that later. Yeah, these, uh, you know, clippings like these, you can't make out much, but they would just cursorily say that there was this Vaidyan by the name of Itti Achudan, and he came from this place, Chertala in uh, Kerala. And then there were these four Brahmins, uh, you know, three Brahmins, sorry. And that was about it. But then, you know, gradually, I suppose it's because of the clout also that the Irava families uh, had, uh, Irava businesses had, that by the time it was the 1990s and all, the, the narrative began to change. Uh, Itti Achudan was called a, a rather sacred figure, a divine figure. His family began to light or was set to light these uh, lamps in the evening uh, at this uh, Kuriyalapura, which is actually a, a place where you rever your uh, elders. And he was called a no noble soul and one of the greatest Ayurveda physicians of the time. So there's a kind of a hagiography building up about him. So I believe that the story of the Hortus is one that needs to be told because everybody realizes it's there, but they do not realize probably what is in there. Because my college library has 12 volumes in English uh, stacked up in the reference section. I suppose it was bought in 2003 when the thing came out. And so I went uh, down there to refer to it, and I found that the laminated, the laminated covers were all sticking to each other, so which means if I pulled one, they all would come together. So it kind of means that you know, nobody, nobody was going through them. So today the, the government of Kerala is honoring Itti Achudan and they want to name institutes after him. They want to name uh, the first Ayurveda 
university in Kerala after him, and so on. So I would say that, you know, the, it's a kind of a 330-year-long journey that this text has taken. So technically, this text is also a traveler text because it traveled, and it's a result of, uh, you know, the, the viewpoints of a lot of travelers, and the text per se has completed a grand circle from starting with Malayalam, going on to Portuguese, Dutch, Latin, English, and finally Malayalam. So it's also the perfect intersection, you know, um, and destination. It's an intersection where everything culminates in knowledge, finally. So, thank you. <laughs> this is the last picture of the, um, in the, it comes at the end of the 12 volumes. It is something called Tena. Why I put it in was that the, the first volume begins with Tenga, which is coconut, and it ends in Tena. So I don't know whether there was unintentional poetry in the ter and the ter. And that's how it ends. Thank you very much. And uh, I think that some of the people in Manucci's stories could use some of the herbs <laughs> in, uh, in the Hortus Balamaricus to achieve their ends. Um, but uh, if I may now introduce our final speaker for the morning, and that is the very organizer of the conference, uh, uh, Rita Banerjee, who is a fellow here at the Nero Memorial Museum and Library, as well as formerly uh, associate professor at the Center for English Studies in Nehru University. Um, she's at the moment having a book, a book um, to be published by Brill called Representing India in 17th Century English Travel Narratives, Ethnography, Protestantism, and the Enlightenment, which I imagine is the kind of book that leads to this conference. Uh, So her paper today will be the Sati in early modern European travel narratives and the politics of exoticization. It's easy. It's not an easy word to say, exoticization. So please, uh, Rita. Okay. Thank you very much, Professor Rubias. And also, um, I would like to thank uh, Nehru Memorial for enabling me to organize this, uh, in which some very interesting speakers' uh, papers have been read and will be read. Um, okay. Next, for like Um, in order to understand the way the early modern and late 17th century narratives represented the sati, one must understand the etymology of the word itself. Sati was the name of Shiva's consort who gave up her life on hearing her husband abused by her father, thereby demonstrating her absolute love for her husband. In the Indian languages, the word sati denotes a woman who exemplifies unflinching loyalty and faith to her husband, although in the European usage, the substantive was transferred to the suicidal act instead of the person. The emphasis on the act rather than the person in European languages suggests the curiosity and interest aroused by this exotic custom among the Europeans. In Indian usage, only a secondary sense of the word connotes the woman who accompanies her husband in death by burning on his fire, generally designated by words like anumarana or sahagamana. According to John S. Hawley, uh, quote, in its origin, sati is a Sanskrit feminine participle derived from the verb to be. He adds that Indic speech prefers the phrase being or becoming sati, sati hona, and finds it awkward to think of performing or doing sati. But the connection remains close, perhaps even essential. Uh, unquote. The climactic moment of a display of virtue and loyalty is when the virtuous woman or sati forsakes her life and accompanies her husband in death. Holly argues that, uh, quote, because this is the moment at which such virtue becomes fully visible. However, there is a sense in which uh, sati as person depends on sati as practice, the actual act of immolation. Unquote. This paper looks at various accounts of the practice as portrayed by some European travel writers over the 17th century. Edward Derry, uh, François Bernier, Peter Mundy, Thomas Bowery, and John Ovington. During these early years of the encounters between cultures, we find variant portrayals of the sati as a heroic and courageous woman, a deluded, pitiable victim, a possessed witch, 
and even an avenging murderess that ensures just a distribution for her partner in crime. This paper argues that the desire to negativize non-Christian religious practices on the one hand and the simultaneous uneasy recognition of the prevalence of similar patriarchal beliefs, cultural values, and prejudices in the West, on the other, produce deeply ambivalent portrayals of the practice of sati. The paper also suggests that there seems to be a shift towards ethnography in the later years, which induced a relatively neutral portrayal, an attempt to rationalize from the Western perspective, and also, in some accounts, to privilege universal human impulses that motivated the act. Uh, among the early travelers, Edward Terry, the chaplain of Sir, of Sir Thomas Rowe, who visited India during the second decade of the century, although he published his travelogue in 1655, describes the practice of sati in some detail. In his account, widow burning appears as entirely a voluntary practice, the wives making the choice deliberately for the sake of honor. After their husband's death, Hindu wid widows never remarry, he states, but they cut their hair and live an utterly neglected life. And he deduces that self-immolation frees them from such a life of neglect and dishonor that, and confers upon them much honor. Terry lords the firm resolution and self-sacrificing ardor of the woman. Quote, when she, the widow, comes to the pile, which immediately after turns her into ashes, yet Yet she who is once thus resolved never starts back from her first firm and settled resolution, but goes on singing to her death. And again, though she have no bonds but her strong affections to tie her unto those flames, yet she never offer, offers to stir out of them. Unquote. However, while Terry showers praise on her steadfastness and love in confronting courageously a painful death, as a Christian clergyman he must needs pity her ignorance and illusory belief as satanic. Uh, quote, but for those poor silly souls who sing themselves into the extremity of misery and thus madly go out of the world through flames that will not last long into everlasting burnings, led, led here unto by their tempter and murderer, deserve much pity from others who know not how to pity themselves. Unquote. However, Terry is unable to give moral sanction to an act of suicide which forms part of the beliefs of a heathen religion and the feat of resolution and steadfast faith gets transformed into a devilish deed. Likewise, the firm, resolute and constantly loving woman undergoes a transformation into the poor, silly soul and the flames which she mistakenly believes would carry her to an everlasting life of union with her husband herald the prospect of everlasting burnings in hell. The language of implicit admiration passes almost imperceptibly into the language of pity and condescension. Terry draws the biblical analogues of the Ammonites who sounded drums and tabors while they made their children pass through fire to Molech to compare the practice of the Hindus in drowning the cries of the burning widow. His rhetoric of pity is also of Christian piety and indignation which induces him to exhort them as poor wretches who serve such a hard master. Quote unquote, a, satanic, uh, a satanic God who compels them to be their own executioners in the flower of their youth and strength. The repetition of the contrast between Satan and God recurs to the chief motive throughout Terry's sketch of this sati, culminating in his astonishment that, quote, the devil should have such an abundance of servants in the world and God so few, unquote. Terry's response to the practice suggests that Sati could serve as an exemplar of wifely devotion and unwavering chastity to uh, European women. Pompa Banerjee points out that to quote widely known texts such as the Book of Common Prayer, reinforced wifely ideals of absolute obedience and surrender that were not unlike the selfless renunciation of the Sati. Unquote. A virtuous widow, which uh, that's what I have there, which features in Sir Thomas Overbury's 32 new characters, seemed akin to the wifely ideal. A virtuous widow shows that the widow suffers a near death in the death of her husband because the joys and pleasures of living cease to matter for her. Quote, she thinks she had traveled all the world in one man. The rest of her time, therefore, she directs to heaven. She had laid his dead body in the worthiest monument that can be. She had buried it in her own heart. To conclude, she is a relic, unquote. A relic implies a memorial of her husband or the veritable remains of a dead per person. Therefore, without relinquishing her life, the virtuous widow becomes the remains of her husband, almost a lifeless object rather than a living human being. Her characterization is an object rather than a living human being whose desires are directed entirely to heaven closely resembles part of the sati who gives up all desire for life and seeks to join her husband in heaven. 
that 17th century English texts on wifely virtue make of the widow a relic of the dead husband indicates the presence of common ideals with respect to the figures of the wife and widow. Terry's praised the constancy and self-sacrificing courage of the Satidro on similar values. As Anya Numa writes, quote, even the harshest colonial criticism included a sneaking admiration for the Sati as the ideal wife who represented the holy, admirable sentiment and theory that the union of man and woman is lifelong and the one permanent thing in the world, unquote. Similar sentiments seem to prevail during this pre-colonial period. Terry projects the patriarchal ideal of feminine constancy in the figure of the sati. He does not seem to have actually witnessed the practice of sati, but unable to reconcile or sanction the dictates of a non-Christian religion with this European ideal of purity, he diminishes her status to that of a pitiable victim. The portrayal of sati in travelogues like that of Terry look forward to late 17th century English drama, which occasionally introduced the practice of sati as a signifier for chastity and wifely devotion. Dryden's Aurangzeb shows the Muslim Melisinda burning herself to death like the Hindu sati, sati to rejoin Morat, her husband, after life. Uh, in his dedication of the play to John, Earl of Malgrave, Dryden presents Melisinda as a woman passionately loving of her husband, patient of injuries and contempt, and constant in her kindness to the last. And in that, perhaps, I may have erred, because it is not a virtue much in use. Those Indian wives are loving fools and may do well to keep themselves in their own country, or at least to keep company with the areas and portions of old Rome. Some of our ladies know better things." Unquote. The depreciatory statement weights a positive stance as shown in the invocation to the classical examples of feminine courage, area, and Portia. The contrast with the supposed wi wisdom of English widows and wives is evidently ironic, that the liberty of English ladies often led them to promiscuity and adultery at the expense of their faithful husbands was a common charge against women in Elizabethan and Jacobian drama. Terry's representation of Hinduism as false and satanic and the allusion to the satanic god compelling the victims to be their own executioners gestures towards later portrayals like that of Bernier of the women as virtually witches themselves. Bernier uh, relates an eyewitness's account of a few instances of the custom of sati, including one in which he directly intervened and succeeded in preserving. At the death of one, um, preventing, sorry, at the death of one of Bernier's friends, a clerk in the employ of, the, of Danishman Khan, an important court official of Aurangzeb, for whom apparently Bernier also worked, he says, my aga, the widow decided to burn herself. Being requested by her friends and employer, Bernier went to dissuade her. He, however, made very little headway by his exhortations to her to live to the benefit of her children, on whom her husband's employer offered to settle a pension, until he threatened her with the prospect of the death of her children by starvation. At first sight, um, Bernier likens the ceremony to witches' Sabbath. Seven or eight old hags and another four or five excited, wild and aged Brahmins standing round the body, all of whom gave by turns a horrid yell and beat their hands with violence. The widow was seated at the feet of her dead husband. Her hair was disheveled and her visage pale, but her eyes were tearless and sparkling with animation while she cried and screamed aloud like the rest of the company and beat time with her hands to this terrible concert." Unquote. Bernier's suspicions demonstrate that any behavior that appeared to him as unnatural in European culture, in this case the determination to die with her dead husband, could easily be construed as witch-like or devilish, just as those who encouraged and abetted such activity could only be witches. Bernier sees his own role as a counselor, if somewhat harsh, a similar someone who, uh, to someone who could rid the woman of evil possession, for as soon as he had pronounced the doom on the woman's sons, if she persisted in her resolution, but first take your children wretched and unnatural mother, cut their throats, and consume them on the same pile, otherwise you will leave them to die of famine, for I shall return immediately to Danish Khan and annul their pensions. She seems to, uh, the widow seems to come out of the spell on hearing this and her head drops on her knees. The old hags and the Brahmins who had persuaded her to commit suicide also slink out as if they realize that their charm has no, long, no power any longer. The description is reminiscent of an act of exorcism. But the move to represent the sati as an uncaring mother and a bewitched woman deprives the widow of the virtue and honor attendant on a loyal wife and still
stigmatizes her as an unnatural mother who acts as a behest of dev devilish priests. The process of exoticizing the custom enables a distancing of self from other, implicitly denying any similarity of values which might have motivated the action. And curiously, however, one perceives an attempt on the part of Bernier at another point in the text to rationalize a custom showing how a woman is persuaded to believe that burning herself on the dead husband's pyre constitutes an act of honor. The attempt to rationalize contradicts his earlier portrayal of the woman as being under devilish possession. I soon found that this abominable practice is the effect of early and deeply rooted prejudices. Every girl is taught by her mother that it is virtuous and laudable in a wife to mingle her ashes with those of her husband and that no woman of honor will refuse compliance with an established custom. Uh, this would remind us of John Locke's argument of the power of custom in human society. Uh, in his essay concerning human understanding, he says, and custom a greater power than nature, seldom failing to make them worship for divine what she hath inert them to bow their minds and submit their understandings to, unquote. Uh, significantly that the prospect of women administering poison to their husbands could be one of the circumstances that led to the growth of the practice of sati again leads us to the patriarchal values of the West. The story of the re revenge of a woman who failed to induce her lover to elope with her after she had killed her husband formed what Stephen Greenblatt might have termed the mimetic capital, which was in frequent circulation, as we see from the references to it by Bernier, Mundy, and Ovington. Bernier makes the lover a Muslim, a tailor, and also a player of tambourine. In his um, tambourine, in his native and narrative, after the lover's refusal to run away with her, the widow takes care not to show her anger. But when she is going round the funeral pyre of her husband and engaged in the customary gesture of leave-taking, she goes up to her lover, who was called to provide music on the occasion, as if she intended to take a last, uh, quote, last and tender adieu, seized him with a firm grasp by the collar, and precipitated herself headlong with the object of her resentment into the midst of the raging fire, unquote. In fact, a number of narratives refer, refer to murders of husbands by wives as a cause of the origin of the practice of sati, reveals the predominance of Western cultural values in the making of the story. Its attempt to provide a stereotypical picture of a false woman capable of poisoning her husband is reminiscent of stories of such poisoning or killing in European history and literature. We have uh, Agamemnon, where Clytemnestra treacherously murders her husband. The Roman emperor, emperor Claudius was allegedly po po poisoned by his wife, Agrippina. In Elizabethan literature, we have interesting examples of an anonymous play, A Warning for Fair Women, and Hamlet's devised playlet, playlet of the murder of Gonzago, which was based on the murder of the Duke of Arbino. These plays show wives poisoning their husbands. In contrast with the two previous accounts related here, Mundy's narrative, uh, Peter Mundy's narrative, which was written earlier, Mundy's travels in, um, earlier than Bernier's. Uh, Bernier, uh, Mundy's travels in India took place during 1620 to 34, and his description refers to a case of Sati at Surat in 1630. Shows an ethnographer's fairly neutral representation of the self-immolation he had witnessed. The neutrality of his stance and his language suggests his curiosity. Uh, about the diversity of customs he witnesses as an onlooker, looking forward to the trend of attributing value to empirical observation in travel writing. Mandi's description of laying the dead man near the river with his feet and part of his body in water, the washing ceremonies performed by his wife and other women, quote, who stood up to the middle in the river, and, unquote, and the making of the funeral fire shows the pro show the process of ethnographic recording and a free from emotional markers. For instance, quote, there was ready-made the pile or place for the funeral fire, laying a good quantity of wood on the floor around it, which were stakes riven in, etc. Um, a small kind of dry thorns and other combustible stuff fashioned like a little low house with a door uh, of the same to it. His sketch shows the room. His deduction about Hindu rituals is also a matter of fact. The statement is grounded in what he had witnessed about the rituals associated with the river and water and partly on prior knowledge, like the reference to the Ganges. Um, I'd just like to show one uh, sketch. Um, Um, this I would contrast later with another uh, sketch. This is uh, very different from uh, some of the others. This is just like a kind of matter-of-fact recording, I would say. 
Uh, significantly, Man Mandy's background was very different from that of Ambassador Rowe, uh, Chaplain Terry, Dr. Bernie, or Priest Ovington. He was, when he was 15 years old, he had worked under Captain John Davis as a cabin boy, and then as an employee of the EIC, he served initially as a writer and then as an underfactor. On his, uh, well, during the early years, he had developed the habit of taking notes during his journey, which he continued in later life. Uh, I just... Unlike Mandy's, Ovington's account of the practice of sati, um, writ this was written towards the end of the century, 1689, published in 1698, seems based on information he had received from others, although his description of the new natural world and sketches indicate em empirical observation. Uh, both Terry and Ovington seem to have found such absolute love as displayed by the wife who accompanied her husband in death as laudable. But while Terry finds religious mandate as the sole cause of this practice, Ovington searches for other causes to explain the custom. His description of the sati seems a concoction of various theories he partly invents and partly derives from the information he has gathered. He links the cultural practices of early marriage and the self-immolation of the sati attributing the courage and absolute love of the sati to the mutual conjugal love that was nurtured and cultivated by long union. And some of the genteel sects, quote, before they feel any great warmth of this amorous passion, are by their parents joined together in their very infancy at three or four years of age, from which time they endeavor mutually to kindle this tender passion till the growing years blow it into a lively flame. And and thus being happily prepossessed by a mutual good liking, even as it were from the womb, as if they had been born lovers, they are taken off from all objects and freed from the disappointments of fickle mistresses and from being wearied by with whining addresses to coy, coy damsels, which, besides others, may be some reason why the Indian wives committed themselves with so much cheerfulness into the funeral claims uh, with their dead husbands because their sympathetic minds linked together from their infancy were then fed with such early tastes of love as became the seminary of those strong and forcible inclinations in their riper years and made the pains of death become preferable to a life abandoned the society of those they so entirely loved." Unquote. By putting the emphasis on mutual love, a natural human emotion, as a motivation for the practice of sati, Ovington shifts the blame from the corrupt priests or the relations who seek to gain by her death, and thereby the stigma from the false religion of heathens. This suggests toleration of difference and willingness to accept the diversity of customs prevalent in the world. Ovington's reason for the performance of sati is evidently speculative, but his recourse to benevolent and common human impulses to explain customs suggests a secular outlook, toleration of diversities, and a belief in the innate goodness of human beings. Uh, I would say that this comes close to the Earl of Shaft's various views. Unlike these accounts of sati, however, there were others which seemed to look forward to the colonial picture of the English man as a savior of Indian women. Coming to the narrative of Bowery, we have a novel element, the Englishman ceasing to be an observer and directly intervening to interrupt the customary ritual, although he too attempts to exoticize the custom. In a geographical account of countries around the Bay of Bengal, 1669 to 79, he refers to a case he had witnessed in Carrera while on his way from Fort St. George to Masulipatam. The Europeans seem to consider the practice of sati as an exhibition peculiar to India. On hearing that a handsome quote that a handsome young widow would be burned with her dead husband, Bowery stayed out of curiosity's sake to see what the truth of such an action that he ha uh, that I have often heard of. Unquote. He seems here motivated by the desire to verify the truth of reports, seeking to make it more credible for his readers. He presents a detailed picture of the location of the event about half a mile from the town on a green plain was a great fire prepared and presents it to his audience as unfolding before his eyes, which makes a convincing eyewitnesses account. Quote, about the third hour in the afternoon, I saw a multitude of men and women, children coming out of the town. I went to them on horseback, thereby to get the better spectacle of this barbarous action. Unquote. Later, he rode close, uh, rode close up to the fire where he could discern the body of a man on, light, on a light fire, near to which lay much combustible matter piled round. 
unquote. The narrative upgrades the persona from the status of a curious onlooker to a participant who, intruding on the scene, tries to dissuade, quote, the seemingly extraordinarily cheerful young, uh, extraordinarily cheerful, quote, young woman who was being induced to sacrifice her life. The recorded details of her appearance, action, and gesture uh, pretended cheerfulness, a smile, and a false claim to the happiness she did not feel suggest a facade, a fictive show. She prevents an outburst of the priest's anger who had overheard Bowery and seemed angry by declaring that it was the happiest hour that ever she saw. Unquote. His account of the final gesture of the woman looking earnestly at him and extending a gift of flowers from her beautifully ad adorned hair to the European who had tried to save her hints at gratitude and romantic adulation. Accounts of such gestures recur in later European narratives. Later in his work, Bowery refers to a rescue of a young sati, which was accomplished by resourceful and prompt English sailors without any resistance of the parties concerned. Quote, only it did very much stomach them that had not been so served before and could find no remedy for it, unquote. Again, he resorts to personal knowledge, saying that he had known the rescued sati, a young, fresh complexion girl, not exceeding 10 years of age, unquote who later, repenting of her act in conquering with such evil heathenish counsels as to commit sati, converted to Christianity and lived with the English in their factory at Masulibatam. Representing the Englishman as a savior of the sacrificed victim, in, victim enables Bowery to distance himself from what he calls a barbarous practice. Such romantic night errantly gestures apparently look forward to the later representations of the Hindu widow as silently crying out to the British government for succor during the colonial period. The responsibility of saving brown women, uh, quote, uh, saving brown women from brown men, unquote, lay, as Gayatri Spivak says, of course, with white men, who are, by definition, humane. Um, by exoticizing sati, the early modern European narratives elided the similarities of cultural values and stereotypes that might be associated with the practice, enabling an unqualified criti critique of the other and moving towards the representation of self as a savior and redeemer. The shift towards ethnography and search for motivation in the social conditions towards the latter half of the century suggests a more detailed and relatively secular attitude towards the cultural practices of the alien. In isolated writings like that of Ovington, we discover a desire to understand the practice of the other by privileging shared human altruistic, altruistic emotions. That's it. Thank you. I, I just show one more picture. This was in, in the 19th century, and I just tried to uh, suggest that there is a difference between this picture and um, that of uh, the sketch of uh, Mandi, which I showed before. It's, uh, I think they are more um, emphasizing more the people who are trying to kill her, kind of, and uh, she is sort of with a hand raised, might be even um, crying out to whoever. Uh, India, India's cries to British humanity, uh, uh, etching depicting a sati from James Peggs, 1832, just to suggest that. Thank you very much. And um, you have not in introduced the case of Pietro de la Valle, uh, but, but, he, yeah. but he, what's interesting about his account is that like Thomas Bowery, he interviews the sati and gives her a voice yes. and tries to really make her the center right. of the narrative. He is doing that there, I would say, as an envoy from his um, governor, Udamum Danishman Khan. So, no, I'm talking about Pietro, no, I'm talking about Pietro de la Valle, the Italian who goes to southern, uh, to, uh, he's in Ikeri, in, in southern India, in, in Karnataka today. Yeah. He, he talks to this woman called Giacoma, who is a sati, and he it's in the 1620s, okay. yes. and he no, and he tries to convince her not to, but he also writes poems in her honor, and and he establishes some kind of relationship with her. So I thought it was interesting.
because his account, I think, was translated into English and must have been influential as well. And it's one of the few accounts that makes the female agent central. I mean, her explanation of what she's doing. You're um, right. Uh, so. Yes, they are certainly exact where people intervene. And I think this is happening much more later because um, uh, Bowery talks about this. Job Chanak in uh, Bengal had actually um, saved a woman and lived with her for a number of, as man and wife yeah. for a number of years. So uh, this was, I would suggest, that, uh, of course you're referring to something earlier, Pietro yeah, yeah. Uh, But at the same time, uh, yes, sometimes they do. And, but uh, Bernier's example, I think, is a little different because he went, uh, because he got a message from his employer, Danish Man Khan. Yeah, yeah, he's... he's he he's, didn't do it yeah. on his own so no, much, I, but I, there, I, yes. Yeah, I, I think, think, I think, I mean, if I may, uh, this, um, I think that what's interesting about Bernier is the sociological explanation about custom inculcated through education which I believe becomes central in the 18th century, in the Enlightenment, and into the 19th century. And when you find the debates in the early 19th century, the, the intellectuals in Bengal fighting Sati are using exactly the same arguments that exactly. Bernie is using in their analysis. So I think that that's, it's a diff But in the case of De La Valle, what I find is the opposite. What's interesting is not the sociological explanation as much as putting the, 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 the psychology of the, of the Sati uh, respecting that, basically putting it at the center and saying, I mean, I cannot agree with you, but I admire you, which okay. is quite, quite a different approach, I think. Uh, that would be interesting, and look yeah, at that. Yeah. But is there any other, other questions or comments also to the other papers? We don't have much time, but we have, I think, five minutes. So if, uh, so a couple of people who would like to ask a question, please feel free. Kate? If you had, sorry, if you had looked at the ways that um, that knowledge was used, so the medical uses, it clearly was a medical, uh, it, was, it was medical purpose, you, as you emphasize, was, was paramount here. So did the Dutch then use those uh, traditional methods? Um, do we know, you know, how much, you know, how, how much, they, they actually benefited from it. And you also talked about the Leiden Botanical Garden being, la being laid out um, following this. I'd like to know a little bit more, if you know anything more yes. about, about how it was actually used in practice in those ways. Uh, actually, they did use uh, the, uh, the herbs in the ways that uh, was mentioned in the book. And in fact, uh, it kind of led to a better networking between uh, the, the plants at Cochin and the plants from Ceylon, all of these began to be documented better for the sake of these you know, medicinal properties. So the soldiers gradually gained access to these and they did find uh, considerable relief as well as, like I mentioned, profits. So there were these uh, plants that were put into use. And uh, one second, with regard to the, uh, the Leiden Garden, you were telling me. Yeah, uh, that is because they were following a certain form of uh, you know, classification at Leiden, and when these plants, you know, uh, the hotels arrived, and you know, when they when they saw the kind of classifications that these people were making, uh, they kind of respected that and maintained those uh, in terms of these plants. So they the were they, so actual plants were also arriving. They no, were the herbarium up. had arrived. So, so you're talking about the way the herbarium was organized. Yes, the herbarium was organized, as well as some of these plants had been classified in the, in the gardens. You know, these plants were taken, some of them, the life samples, later on, not with the otis, yeah, yeah, yeah. but later on they had traveled there. So yes, so actual live plants are only being transported later when, because it's very hard to keep plants alive. Yeah, because uh, in Ceylon, uh, they were sending these plants uh, all the way to Leiden, as well as to Batavia. So, so there was also, at this time, there was also transport of, of, of live plant material. Yes, but not immediately, but gradually with the passage of time. Not uh, from 1678 to 1693, no. Th those were the times when the book was written. I would like to give room for any other questions. 
I'm Geetika. I was wondering uh, how might one how might one think of the contemporary history of this uh, classical botanical text in the context of biological uh, patents and intellectual property rights? Oh, I was hoping somebody would ask me that because I didn't find time in the paper. Actually, uh, what happens is that uh, you know the Hortus Malabaricus stands as an, an important bastion in protecting uh, the intellectual property rights of the herbal knowledge from India. Okay? Because uh, a lot of pharmaceutical companies are interested in filing patents for these particular plants and their medicinal values, like what happened with turmeric a couple of, you know, some years ago. So what happens is that uh, thanks to the existence of the Hortus, we can claim something called prior knowledge which means that we already knew what these were being used for and we had been using them and hence they are ours. So in terms of trips and in terms of intellectual property rights, uh, this is one of the reasons why, you know, I, I suppose I'm given reliable information that they are seeking to set up an Ayurveda university in Kerala in order to ensure that this kind of biopiracy does not come about. Uh, because uh, there was this very famous case with the uh, Tropical Botanical Garden Research Institute uh, approaching... Uh, a tribe called the Kani uh, in and around Trivandrum because they had this uh, kind of herb that they mashed and drank in order to give them energy. And it was called Arogya Pacha. Pacha is green and Arogyam is health. All right? So uh, the TBGRI offered them uh, you know, royalties for producing this and they took the rights and sold it to another Ayurvedic company, manufacturing company, for 10 lakhs. But then the question came about as to, you know, who, which of these Kani tribe members are going to get it? Is it going to be, you know, that uh, they're all going to get it together? And how are they going to go about distributing it? And then who's going to be cultivating these plants? In the middle of all of this tug of war, what happened is that a U.S. company filed international patent. They forgot to take international patent. So filed for international patent and got the rights. And now these pills are available for 60 pills for $22 or something. So this happens. Is, is there any questions for the other paper, Chadi Adwo? Yeah. Uh, thank you, all the speakers, for such fascinating papers. My question is to Dr. Jyoti Atwal. Thank you, ma'am, for such an interesting paper. Uh, uh, I just want to, uh, like you have, uh, like I, it, I have read, like you mentioned about so many fascinating different, different stories in Manushi's uh, writing. I just want to, I'm just interested to know, is there the, is there any criteria which you have observed in which he have created other, like one case you mentioned, there is this Momden servant in Portuguese house and the other women, like is this othering created on gender base, like religious basis, caste basis, or this in general it was just because you are an other. So this othering is created on any particular categories you found or it's just the creation, just the other is created in general. I don't know whether I'm like, is it? Yeah. Thank you, Rekha. Uh, actually, the othering is a general phenomena. It's not only gender, it's happening in every aspect of writing. The othering is very much there. But what I was pointing out to is the gender, the other othering within the gender as well, because the way Portuguese men are looked at and the construction of Portuguese women's sexuality, even Portuguese men's sexuality, you know, there is no one other. You know, this const others are constantly being produced. So I don't think I was at all focused on that other. It, it, it is in my title, uh, which was originally, you know, we decided on titles and so. But as you could see, it was mostly focused on Portuguese women, uh, you know, how Manuchi rates them. That was the entire exercise about, yeah. But thanks for bringing it up, yeah. It wasn't really othering, I mean, multiple levels of othering. Can I, can I, uh, sorry, sorry, please. This is just an observation. Actually, the Bengali word harmad, chor dakat harmad. Harmad is Spanish armada. No, no, I am, uh, yes, yes, yes. So, uh, in popular, you know, culture, the <laughs> harmad is always associated with violence. And in old Bengali text, uh, 16th century text, you know, the sailors, they are uh, sailing at night 
fearing this her much. Uh, Firangir deshkhan bahe korno dhare, ratri ze bahiya jai harma der dore. Harma, root word is Spanish armada, but in popular, you know, perception, it is the, you know, this pirates. So I'm saying, you know, that Portuguese in uh, popular Bengali notion, it's always associated with violence, nothing else. <laughs> Professor Rubis, could I just make a comment on uh, uh, Rita's uh, paper? Yeah, yeah, just one question. minute, yeah. It's the last question because we need to go for lunch now. Not so even a question, it's yeah. just a comment. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you both. You know, your papers were fascinating. Rita, this is just for just a comment. You know, it's interesting. You you mentioned the, uh, the various, you try to look at, you categorize the various writings. <coughs> Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, the 19th century question of ban when it came up, I think what operated then was not none of these uh, exotic images you were ever, you know, considered. It is the church which becomes very important then. It is uh, the three, um, you know, the, uh, the three priests from uh, Will, uh, Fort William College who basically petition and, you know. So it's very interesting how religion takes over this entire exoticism and it's turned into a channelized two states, very interestingly, in the first half. I've looked at this in my book, but um, thank you. And also, I just, I just want last point about uh, the fear amongst the, uh, amongst the travelers is that I feel the fear is that there, is the, there are these moral mo moorings, you know, which they carry. Because this is there is loss of that according to them uh, in Europe, and because it's got to do again with the Protestant movement there, and Protestant Church Reformation, post Reformation, and the divorce cases which are going, growing. I don't know how how true is that. We really, I mean, I'm not a historian of that period, late uh, late medieval, but I have some uh, you know uh, colleagues who are working on this, and they said there were a lot of evidence from. Europe, uh, you know, they were divorce courts and so on. So I'm just thinking, you know, it could be just, uh, you know, it's just to add on, it's just a comment, it's not a question. Thank you. Do you thank want you. to say something, Rita? Uh, yeah, I, uh, thank you. I, I'd look into this, uh, but I do understand the, the legal point that you're saying. At that time, uh, the yes, they tried to show whether or not they were sanctioned for the sati at all in uh, religion, in Hinduism because they didn't want to alienate these people or antagonize them. And uh, only to show that there was no uh, real, um, I mean, there, it was not a mandate that uh, sati had to be um, uh, performed. And that's how they managed to bring in the Good. Excellent. I think we can stop now because we have to as well. And um, there's going to be a lunch at the auditorium, uh, which is on the ground floor. Uh, but in any case, before we do that, I would like to thank again all the speakers for this very um, suggestive session with lots of synergy between the papers. So thank you.